I'd love to welcome our speaker for tonight, Joris. Give him, give him a moment. Thanks, Cheers. Everyone, I'm Joris. Um, I work at Google as a product manager. I've been at Google for a while, for about six years. Done a number of different things there. I've worked in sales and marketing for two years. I worked in finance for two years. And now, a bit over two years, I work in product management. And specifically, I work in uh, what we call the Next Billion Users organization, which is where we try to build better products for people in emerging markets. Uh, out of curiosity, I wonder uh, where people, what people do in this room, where they come from. Is it uh, engineers in here? Okay, quite a few. Students? OK, quite a few as well. Now I've got to guess. Is any other product managers? Oh, quite a few as well. OK, great. What companies? Where are you from? It's called Elevate. It's a big auditing firm. OK, awesome. Um, what other roles do people have, or what are people doing? Uh, data analysts. Data analysts, OK, awesome. Cool. OK, so nice, nice mix of, uh, of different kind of tech-oriented tech people. Um, um, working with the works. Some? Yeah, for some reason it's like, sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, so yeah, I've been with Google for about, uh, for some time. I studied uh, back in Amsterdam, where I'm from. Uh, did a, a master's in economics. Currently studying, uh, taking, uh, taking courses at Stanford, uh, graduate courses in artificial intelligence, which is, is pretty interesting. Very different type of, uh, of thing to, to be doing. Um, uh, extremely technical, but a, but a ton of fun. Um, but I'm going to mainly be talking about what I do um, here at Google right now and um, how we at Google go about trying to build great products for people in emerging markets, which I think is a pretty, it's a pretty tough challenge given that we are this US-based company. Uh, we all kind of are in our little, little bubble in California and then you try to build products for an audience that is entirely different from, from your, your, your surroundings. Sorry, I'm blocking the screen. <laughs> Where is this better? Uh, that's good. Or on the other side. Audio side, okay. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty tricky challenge, really. Um, and I'm just going to tell you about like, what have we learned uh, from doing this over the last couple of years. How are we going about it? How do we do research, which is a, a absolutely critical component of it? Is this not working? No. Sam, the Chromecast is not working. Yeah, so for some reason, when, when I try to uh, cast it on the TV, it stops me from casting on that TV. So So the slides have very little information on them. <laughs> the, the text is not going to get any smaller than this. So I think, we're, I think we should be good with this screen. But maybe if, if people really can't see it, maybe you should come. There's some chairs here as well. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about that mainly. Um, so a couple, couple components that I'm going to be talking about. First, about where the users are. And you'll quickly notice why I'm going to be talking about that. Um, I'm going to be talking about what we've learned by building, trying to build better products for emerging markets over the last couple of years. Uh, I'm going to provide some uh, tips from Google uh, to build for these audiences, and uh, some tips on research, which are kind of more my, my own experiences in doing research and uh, what I learned from that, what worked well. And feel free to interrupt me anytime, by the way, if you have any questions or uh, whatever. Um, so internet growth is happening everywhere, right? It's definitely not just the US. Actually, there's not that much happening in the US. Um, it's, it's happening in a, on, a, uh, on a very global level on, in a lot of different places in the world. So if you look at the total number of internet users, so this is the nominal amount of internet users by country, back in 2014, you see a couple places light up. Uh, US is one of the places. China is, clear, is, is another place. And some other places you see uh, some, 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 some darker shades, but it's, it's pretty much those two places that, are, that have the bulk of the users. Um, if you go forward to 2016, um, you can see one other country particularly pronounced there as well, which is India. Um, you see Brazil popping up a little bit as well, and Nigeria in Africa is, is coming out a bit. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the current uh, number of users that we see in those countries. I think a more interesting view than this is, the, is to look at the new internet users. If you look back in 2014, um, it's already very clear, US is not where that is happening, right? That's not where people are coming online. Um, it's happening in China, it's happening in India, again, you see Nigeria there in Africa, uh, Brazil. Um, 
This is a little distorted because it looks at the total number of users. Um, so there's a ton of other smaller countries where you also see a lot of people uh, coming online. But the crux of the message is that it's uh, particularly happening in these kind of uh, emerging markets that we talk about. Scroll forward to 2016 and you can very quickly see why there is one country that we focus on primarily. Um, it's India. Last year, more than 100 million people, in 2016, more than 100 million people came online for the first time in India. Um, those people did not come online on computers like we did. Um, they came online on smartphones. That is their, uh, as we say, primary computing device. That is the, uh, the sole way that they access the internet right now. Um, so 100 million is a big number, but there was a second time 100 million new internet users came online in India. The year before, we saw the same number of people coming online in India. So these kind of numbers, they're, they're pretty mind-blowing. Um, forecasts say that by 2020, we might reach a billion unique mobile subscribers in India. That is, again, <laughs> to me, a pretty mind-blowing number. That is kind of the whole population of Europe, the whole population of US together, and then still you're not at one billion. And that is just this one country, right? That is just India. So if you hear me talk about India a lot, you can kind of, I hope you understand why that is. It's, it, there is that's the place where the huge number of new users are coming online. Um, so this is kind of a, a, a clear consequence of this. We see hundreds of millions of people on Chrome, the web browser, as well as Android, the operating system, uh, coming from these next billion user countries. Um, and again, with next billion user, we mean kind of any country that roughly meets the emerging market criteria. Um, three typical ones, Brazil, Indonesia, and India. And they're all right now in the top 10 countries if you look at the search volume that we see on Google search. Um, so the total number of searches, these three countries are already in the top 10. And as you can imagine, they're going upwards as well, right? There, uh, as you saw with these numbers of internet users in India, more and more are coming online. Uh, so more and more are going to be searching as well. These are huge, huge numbers. Also interesting, by the way, is sometimes it feels a little wrong almost to be talking about countries as diverse as Brazil, India, and Indonesia as kind of one block of countries. Um, and there definitely is an extreme amount of diversity uh, between all these emerging markets. Um, however, and I'll touch on that later as well, there's also a bunch of things that they definitely have in common, and particularly technology-wise. Um, yeah, and even within India, you could argue it's not really one country. The, uh, the cultures are extremely diverse. Different regions are, have different languages, different customs. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's a very diverse country. So what have we learned over the last couple of years trying to build great products for people in those markets? Now, this is one of those things that we see kind of as a as a common thing among people in these markets, if you look at the technology in particular, is they have very low-end smartphones. Because again, we're building, uh, I'm not sure if I should have made it clear, but we're building software for smartphones, right? Internet software, apps, those type of things. Um, they have very low-end smartphones. You can, buy, you can buy new smartphones in India for $50. Uh, that's probably more than 10 times cheaper than the, the smartphones that we have. Um, so you can imagine that the, the, the kind of specifications that these smartphones have, they're a lot lower than what we are used to. Um, we, we saw this survey done by Western Digital that found that uh, a third of smartphone users in India, they have daily storage issues. So I don't know how many, people, how many of you have, have issues on your phone with storage running out. Um, I've had it now on my phone after like a year of usage. In India, a third of people have it every day. So it's kind of a, on a whole new level of how, uh, how pressing these type of issues are. And I think this is a great example of, of something that does span across these countries, because we see the same type of things in uh, Brazil. Um, actually, yesterday, we ran a study on this in Brazil, and we saw uh, over 20% for this as well. Um, another thing is people are on slow internet. Uh, Wi-Fi is not very widely available in general, um, so mobile connection is the primary means that people go online and that they, uh, that they use internet. Um, right now, still about half of people in India are on uh, 2G. Um, and to give a comparison of what 2G is, because I don't think I ever actually used 2G myself, um, this is uh, pretty much the internet, I looked it up uh, just today, it's pretty much the internet I had 20 years ago when I first used the internet. 
It's, it's that kind of speed. Um, and you can imagine that 20 years ago, the internet was kind of built for having that type of speed, right? But given that the current mobile internet is very much built for people in the US that, have, uh, that are connected always, um, it's, it, this is a really slow speed to be getting all your stuff from the internet. And with that, it's also good to, uh, yes? I want to go back to the storage uh, yep. part. Um, what do you think the reason is? Is it because uh, the data uh, that is produced is more, or the, the device memory that they use is lower than average? What's the reason? It's both. Um, so we, yeah, we've studied this quite a bit, actually. Um, you see that um, they definitely have less storage than we would have on our phones. Um, but they also they save a lot more on their phones. Um, we are kind of very used to having things in the cloud and things in our email, et cetera. For them, they make sure they save it on their phone because they're not always connected. So they have a ton of media on their phone. Um, I'm generalizing, of course, but like in, in large trends, that's true. Um, also, um, yeah, I think those are the primary two reasons. So like um, lower end hardware and saving a lot more stuff offline on your own phone. And again, you have to realize that for them, uh, their smartphone, smartphone is pretty much what for us is our computer. Uh, this is their only way, their only piece of technology to access the internet and to save their files. So they use it in a much more, in a way in, in which we would use our computers. Yeah, sorry, another question. To add to that, uh I mean, they're basically running on four or eight gigs of memory, and they are constantly sharing a lot of movies. Yes. A lot <laughs> <Yeah>. of piracy. <laughs> that happens, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One more thing to add. So I've used smartphones from very low range, which comes for 3,000 to 4,000 rupees, huh. to I'm spending now 50 to 60,000 on one phone. Hmm. But the main reason that India, as in India, that they use most memory that the phone has to offer because we don't have, as you said, the internet quality is not good, the internet speed is not that good. Yep. So if we want to access our files wherever we go, we have to store them in our phone so that we can access them offline. That's the primary reason Great. why we run out of storage. <laughs> Rather than some privacy or anything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just, just for the record. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. 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 Completely agree. And so I, I apologize in advance. I'm gonna make a ton of generalizations. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, completely agree. Yeah, just for people that didn't hear it, like the, the diversity, uh, in particular urban versus rural, is, is huge in terms of connectivity, <laughs> phones, et cetera. So, yeah. Are any of these issues similar in China or completely different in China? I don't actually know that much about China, to be honest. Uh, the way okay. I, I, I've read about China quite a okay. bit, uh, the way sometimes kind of as a rule of thumb, people say you can look at China as um, kind of five years ahead of India in terms of, or five or 10 years ahead of India in terms of development. So you see the same kind of trends, but they're further ahead. Just one more thing to add. Uh, the internet, at, like, at the current stage, India has better internet than the United States. We get 4G internet, yep. one gig per day. Yeah, with Geo, right? With Geo, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's true. Like, it's a, yeah, you have this mobile carrier, Geo, which is changing the landscape super rapidly in India. Um, that's definitely true. Uh, to be seen where it goes over the next year, next two years, is that sustainable, et cetera. Um, but that's definitely true in India, that, that's the thing that's at place, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna continue. <laughs> um, so this one other thing is also, when I talk about India, you can kind of see it as a, um, uh, you can kind of apply this to a lot of other countries, right? So where some of these issues in some areas in India are less pressing right now, you can, uh, in many other countries, they're at the, the same level. So another thing you gotta think about then is um, what we consider to be kind of a free app, it, for, for many people, is not really considered free. If you look at uh, popular apps such as uh, Facebook or CleanMaster or other, other apps that are super popular in India and elsewhere, um, these are like 40 to 50 megs, I think. Um, if you pay for every megabyte that you download, which a lot of people do, and a majority do, I think, um, it's, uh, that's not really free anymore. Um, in particular, like the data costs, they differ very much over countries and over regions. Um, but 
you got to imagine that if your income is, let's say, at one-tenth of what our incomes are here, but the data costs approximately the same, then all of a sudden you're looking at, um, uh, if, if you'd have the same amount of usage as we do, you'd, you'd be looking at several hundred dollars worth of uh, monthly mobile bills, right? So you're going to be a lot more careful about what you spend your money on. So downloading anything, is, in general, people tend to be a lot more careful about it, and they tend to avoid large apps, large files, etc. So yeah, that's one, that's one kind of advice that we give and that we take ourselves, is try to remove that barrier of downloading big things. Um, there's a couple ways to do this. I, yeah, there's a couple ways to do this. Uh, one way is um, build a light app. That's what you see a lot of companies do, right? They, they have one app which is 50 megs and they have one app which is 5 megs. Um, that's a pretty typical solution to this. Um, other solution is build a very lightweight website. Um, there's other solutions as well, uh, like uh, what are they called? Uh, uh, progressive web apps. Uh, there's a, a bunch of technical solutions to this, but I think the important thing to keep in mind is um, anything that's lots, lots of megabytes is going to be pretty tricky. Uh, people are, uh, it's, it's a bit of a barrier for people to be using it. And so very closely related to that is optimized for speed. Um, what for us loads in five seconds, for people on 2G might very well load in two minutes. So a two minute waiting time is a lot of time. People are a little more used to it in those, those areas. But, uh, uh, but obviously if you can trim that down to uh, to half or a quarter of, uh, of the loading time, that's, that's going to help a lot. Um, and any improvement you make in loading time is obviously also going to benefit everybody in, in America and in other Western countries. So this is a very important one, built for intermittent connectivity. So you can see that I think also Google products in the past um, and many other products that were built uh, in the US and in other Western countries, they very much assumed that you were online and that you were online with a decent connection. And once that was not the case, things didn't work well at all. Um, however, the reality in many of, uh, many of the next billion countries is that um, there can be gaps in connectivity. And these gaps can be very different amounts of time. Sometimes people don't have connectivity for a couple seconds, right? That happens a lot. Or sometimes people don't have connectivity for a minute. Sometimes they don't have connectivity during the day. They only have connectivity during night. Or sometimes they only have connectivity every other couple of days because uh, they don't top up their data, so they have a couple of days without data. So those kind of, that kind of intermittent connectivity is, is extremely important, I think, to, to take into account. Um, and uh, so you, you really got to start thinking about, or at least for us, we really had to start thinking about not just an offline state and an online state, but also kind of a bad connectivity state, um, kind of these intermediate, uh, intermediate kind of areas of connectivity that, that are extremely prevalent in those countries. Um, I don't know, I, I noticed that Google Maps, for example, does it, uh, uh, started doing this recently where in some situations it says, oh, you have uh, a bad connection. It doesn't say you're offline, it says you have a bad connection, and then it kind of alters your experience to make sure that it works well even if there's no data for 20 seconds, those type of situations. And again, just to, um, to highlight how used we are to, uh, to, to, having, to being always online, to me, it's very telling that when I'm in an elevator, I'm like a little bit annoyed that I can't use the internet. I'm like, ah, oh. it's like 20 seconds without internet, and that's, this is such a short period. Or on a flight, you really, at least I, I really, really notice that I don't have internet for a couple hours at a time. Um, so just imagine that's kind of a everyday experience for, uh, for most of these people in, in, in those regions. So these are two, uh, two pretty cool Google solutions that we have. One is uh, on Chrome. You get this, if you're offline at that point, you can say, I want to download this page later. And we have that great little dinosaur game. I don't know if people know that. It's pretty awesome. This dinosaur and you jump around. It's, I spend a lot of time when I don't have connectivity doing that. Um, and in Google Search, we have this option nowadays that it will, um, if you're offline, it will push you the, the search results at a later stage, which is also pretty useful. So I think these are, these are two just, just kind of random examples, but these are two interesting solutions to, to dealing with this 
uh, on-off connectivity type of situation. Um, so another thing, we kind of touched on it with the diversity in India, but uh, languages. So if you just look at that one country, India, um, you folks probably know better than I do, but I think there's 22 or more languages that are... 26? 26. But then in 26 languages, we have different regional languages, so it goes beyond 1,000 languages. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. That's anywhere between 22 and, and more than 1,000. A lot of languages in India. Um, and that's just one country, right? So the, obviously, the diversity in languages, if you want to target, all of these users that are coming uh, online in different places, it's just, it's just huge. Um, so yeah, you've you got to make sure you do that, because in India, I think it's also, it's about 10% of people that speak English, and they speak it to different degrees. Correct me if I'm... No, actually that has changed a lot okay. in the last 10 to 20 years, because every, every child in India almost gets the education of English language, so they are pretty much familiar. So okay. yes, when you compare non rural areas, yes, they, they are not so familiar with it, but then still, it's changing. Okay. So English, English users is going up a lot. Yes, a lot. Because... And basically, as, we, as uh, you already know that there are 22 to 26 different languages yep. we have in India, so they all don't speak the common language, which is even people consider Hindi as a national language, it is not. Mm -hmm. And they don't speak Hindi. So in order to communicate, we always use English language. Because huh. I have some of my friends from the south of India, and they and I, they always communicate in English. Ah, oh, great. That's great. Yeah, we have, it's interesting. We have, uh, actually, the majority of my team um, has, has roots in India. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we go out in the field and we do research, it's like, oh, great, we got somebody from India with us. He can speak to the, to the people on the street. But it's hardly ever the case that it actually works out because of the, the languages are different. Um, so, yeah, speak many languages. And uh, w one interesting thing that we find also uh, just kind of a, a random insight, is that a lot of people, they, uh, they want to have their software, such as their phone, in English, um, but a lot don't actually understand the English very well. This is um, I'm just saying what we saw in our research. is a different... That happens because people sometimes choose to go with the language that they know rather than learning a new language. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We see that. We see. We see that happen. Um, we see a lot of people. Uh, what we're also experimenting with is, is seeing if you can do some kind of mix of uh, um, some pieces in English, in particular the words that people are familiar with, such as let's say internet or download, etc., and some other parts in local languages. Um, it's pretty tricky to get this right because some people choose to have their app in English but don't actually understand it. Some people. I choose to have it in another language, but then the translations don't work for them. So it's this is a really difficult one to get right. Don't you have like, in your product the recycled automatic localization in way? Like when you push the code, you have like the end and or whatever. Yeah, yeah, we do. So it gets our, our the apps and the software that we built. It gets automatically uh, translated. So obviously, there's translators doing it, but um, that's true. Um, yeah, there, there needs to be quite a bit of quality control on it. Um, and it also, it kind of depends. So I, I would argue our software in general, the local translations are pretty decent. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad you say yes. Uh, but I think it's not, that's not the case for every, uh, for every app and all the software out there. I have a quick question here. Yep. So earlier you said there are 22 plus languages that you're targeting. Yep. So wouldn't this increase the size of the app that yeah, you yeah. need to install? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Like, it's, it's a really good question. It's something, uh, there are solutions to it. Currently, in uh, some of the software that I'm involved in right now, we're not actually using any of the solutions. But you're right, the, like, in the size of, for example, an app that I'm working on, um, about 20% of that is just all these languages. It's, it's a lot of the size. Um, there are solutions. There are technical solutions to it. You can, for example, make sure that um, um, phones in different languages get different apps, right? Different, differently localized apps. 
You can indeed do regional ones. Um, you can let users download a specific language in the app. Uh, so there are solutions to it. Uh, but you're right, this is a problem, and this is, uh, th there's different ways to go about it. So there isn't one unified Google way to do this? Or? Um, if there is, we're not, <laughs> I'm not using it. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd love to use it, because this is definitely an issue for us. So other issues that you're going to walk into is that um, you don't really know what language a user is going to want. Um, it may very well be, like it's very likely that his phone is in, uh, is in English. So, but then what, what language are you going to push? I mean, English definitely got to be there, but then you probably want to have like a range of other options if he actually wants to have like Bengali or Hindi or whatever. Um, this is another thing that uh, Google search did around languages. I think if you search uh, specific terms or in specific regions, it starts showing your regular results in English, but it also shows a second tab where uh, you get all your results in Hindi. And this, this um, according to the team, it, uh, it got a 50% increase in the amount of Hindi that people were searching for. And this is another one. This is this one's pretty interesting to me. Um, so, oh, sorry, yep, yes, sir. Yep. Is, there, is there a way for me to simulate that here, like get the Hindi? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, maybe through a VPN. Yeah. Um, this is another one that's, that's interesting. Um, when we build software normally for people in California or in the U.S. or in the Western world. Uh, we take a pretty minimalist approach where we uh, everything is white and there's very few buttons and that's kind of the if you just think about the Google search page, right? It's extremely minimalist. Um, what we do find in uh, um, when building software for countries such as India is uh, you got to do quite a bit more effort to uh, guide the user certain ways to help them understand what they need to do um, and those type of things. So I think there's kind of two components to this. One is, that's to me the most interesting, I think uh, just general life in, uh, in particular urban India is so much busier than general life is in, for example, the Bay Area. And that is reflected not just in kind of the day-to-day -day life on the streets as, and in do, uh, going about your life, but it's also very much reflected in the software that they use um, and the, the, the apps they have on their phone, those type of things. Um, they, get, they tend to get way more notifications there's way more animations happening in apps, and it's, it's, it's a very, to, kind of to my eyes, a super busy experience. But to, uh, to a lot of people in India, that's, that's the experience they're used to, and that's kind of the experience they want as well. Uh, so that's something that we really got to adapt to. So that, that's one component to it. I think the other component to it is that uh, you just got to be a little more clear about try this, uh, press this button, uh, like do a bit more effort to guide people a certain way. Uh, that can be done by like bigger icons, uh, brighter colors, uh, those type of things. What was your sample size for um, so It's not necessarily sample size. Uh, so we do we have a huge research team um, which does a lot of like we do all types of different research. Um, so for something like this. So yeah, again, this is not this is not one piece of research. We do sometimes we do kind of survey-based research over many thousands of people. Uh, sometimes we do in-field research, which I'm going to talk a little bit about later. Where um, due to the constraints that you have, you don't reach more than like two dozen people. Um, sometimes we do kind of very intensive one-on-one -on -one interviews, and then you have a very small sample size. So it really depends on the type of research you're doing. Um, is that because people want more features, or is that because people like more features? So it's, it's more of an observation of what we see people using. And apps that are built in India and for India, and the phone experience that we, that we see people in India having, um, reflect that type, of, uh, that type of experience. So it's a way more busy experience. I think the reason for that yep. is more because people from one single product want more, rather than yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, it's that's a very. 
Fair enough. That, that, that could very well be. I think, I think there's a, a bunch of elements in here. Uh, but you've, I think your statement is definitely right in the sense that a lot of the apps that are popular in markets such as India, but also China and other places, are extremely feature rich. As in, like, they're kind of five apps in one. And we're like, what is this app? What does it do? Oh, it does antivirus, it does email, it does uh, checking my phone. It's like, oh. <laughs> um, so th th you were right. I think there's kind of also a tendency to have more functionality in one piece of software than what we are used to. Is it also the ad, like, monetization strategy difference when you end up having a lot more ads? Is that why it's more busy or just, like, features? So uh, it's part of it. So the ads, ads definitely make the experience busier. Um, but we definitely, so look at an app such as Clean Master, for example. I don't know if you've, you've ever used that, but that's like uh, uh, hundreds of millions of users in India have Clean Master. You've used it. Um, I mean, I've used it when I used it in India. <laughs> Clean Master? Cash. Cash cleaning, yeah. It's, it's pretty famous in India. It's very famous in India. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's one, it's one of the t absolute top apps in India. Um, but that has like a lot of animations, and there's so much happening, and like I get lost. But it's that's a, it's an experience that works very well. Yeah, they have almost I think ten to fifteen different features in one app. Yeah. But yeah, that app is really helpful for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> great. Is, is there something that Google, uh, like you and Google specifically, do, for example, make Gmail more? Feature over there, or? Uh, you mean like expand the feature set? Yeah, like a Google app. Um, so, hmm, so it's it's interesting. It is something that we kind of talk about, like how feature rich should your app be, and there are kind of different opinions on it. Uh, some people are very much like you do one thing, you do it really well, nothing besides that. Other people are more like, oh, you do a bit of that, a bit of that, and uh, you kind of go that way. Um, there's different opinions on it. I think the general consensus at Google would be uh, do one thing and do it really well. Um, but obviously, like to your point as well, like as we see apps in India and in China being extremely popular, that definitely don't do one thing but do at least five things. Uh, it does also make us ask the question: Should we? Uh, is, is this the right approach to take for countries such as India? Um, I think this is kind of a very a minimal example, but uh, this shows this is a, a type of experience that we have in general on Chrome, opening a new tab. It's this very, uh, it's very minimalist, gray, and you can do, uh, you, can, you can start wherever you want. And um, then what uh, an experience in India could look like is uh, you give people a, little more, a few more options, you guide them a little more towards certain directions. <laughs> you agree with this? <laughs> Great. Um, so to repeat the, the things that I went over, and feel free to, if you have any questions on those, because uh, this is the end of that, that part. Um, remove download barriers, because downloads, they're, uh, they're not free for people. Um, people really think about downloading. So as, as much as you can uh, remove the megabytes, that's, uh, people are going to really like that. Optimize for speed. So just think about what your app would do on uh, uh, on a, how, how, how your app would load or your website would load on a 2G connection and, uh, and make sure that's uh, at least somewhat decent uh, for, for that type of experience. Um, address intermittent connectivity. Again, this is one I think is extremely important. Don't just think about uh, online, offline, but start thinking about all these intermediate states of having some connectivity every now and then. Um, it's a very important one. Uh, multilingual, we talked about a lot <laughs> with a thousand plus languages in India. Um, and guide new users more than you might do for, uh, for software otherwise. So, a question? Why go through all this trouble? Why, why go through the trouble? Uh, so, I mean, why does Google want to invest so much for the next building? They mostly come from rural areas and their spending power is too less. So yeah, for us it's um, it's uh, so I wouldn't necessarily be able to comment much on the uh, kind of larger business goals, but it's very clear that if you have a billion people coming online, that's important, right? Uh, yeah, data, but uh, I think I think more importantly, um, 
I think more importantly, just the size of the groups of these people. And they're going to use search. They're going to use the internet. They're going to see ads. Uh, I think those type of things are, are important. Can you elaborate more on the guiding research? Like, what are the key criteria that you are looking to when you are on that aspect? Yeah, sure, yeah. I don't know if I have much more to say about it than, than what I said previously, but it's um, basically don't go for the minimalist approach that you might want to go for um, in a product that you built for here. So uh, give users more options, give users, um, uh, give them clearer visual cues to what to press, where to go, what to try out. Um, I think those, those would be the most important. So an example of this would be like when you do a Google, even like on the Google search bar, you continuously see some new sort of way to use Google search, some mathematics search for whether check my reminders or something. Like that. It's a good example. Do you have a question? Yeah. Do you can you talk a little bit about um, maybe research around local competitors or I, have you ever experienced that? I don't know. If there's any major competitors in India, like local companies, or yeah. how do you deal with um, exploring just local, either you know, based on policy, government policy, or just business competition? Yeah. It's a good question. So when we build products at Google, we have this kind of philosophy that we don't necessarily look at competition as much. Um, obviously, we're not like oblivious to competition. We realize what's there in the market. But we, we try to have kind of this laser focus on building something great that works really well for users. And if you just kind of, the, the philosophy is if you focus enough on that, um, things are going to work out. Um, so that's, again, that's not to say we're oblivious to, to competition. We, uh, we do research and we, we map out what other players in, in the markets that we're active in are doing. Um, but no like, unique lessons on researching competitors in emerging markets versus established Western markets or any anecdotes uh, so it's a good question, but no, we're, like if you, if you, for example, compare our effort in uh, researching users versus researching competitors, mm -hmm. we do at least ten times the amount of effort in researching users than we do in competitors. It's it's really user focused. Yep. Um, since she asked that question about research, how much research can you do like here versus in context research, like traveling to India, whatever? I got a section coming up on research. So, <laughs> if you have a question after that, please ask. Okay. Any more questions on these? Yes. Not on these, but an outside question. Maybe you can answer yeah. later when you're summing it up. That the company of the size of Google and that this kind of the amount of input that you have, how would a product manager really convert it to, to, into a product? That would be a mind-boggling task. Uh, how would it, so, so I didn't fully understand the question? Yeah, uh, it's, it's a very broad question. I think so. We, we have two types of efforts. One effort is we look at our current products and we apply a lot of these lessons to them and see can we make those better for, uh, for people in countries such as India. Um, and we have different efforts where we try to build kind of new products ground up uh, specifically for India. And um, yeah, both, both kind of we take these same type of principles into account. Uh, you do a lot of research, uh, you try to understand uh, what is working, what is not. You try to understand uh, what big needs are that users have. Uh, you try to f very deeply understand user behavior. And then you come up with ideas. Um, you start testing those ideas in the market. Um, it's a long, like this is kind of my, my whole job. So uh, it's, it's a long process with a lot of aspects to it. Um, I'd be very glad to talk more about it uh, later, um, particularly if you have uh, like more specific questions that I that I could go into. I'd, I'd love to talk about it more. How, how big is the next billion users group? Um, I, I wouldn't know from the top of my head. And I also wouldn't know if I would know. I wouldn't know if I should comment on it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Did they like Google Plus or Facebook? Sorry. Did they like Google Plus or Facebook? If I like Google Plus, Facebook. Like, uh, Facebook, it's very popular. Yes, <laughs> it's. Uh, I, smartphone for Facebook and WhatsApp. I think Facebook is like the, the yeah, a very popular app. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, so then I'm going to talk about research. Um, these are kind of more personal types of anecdotes. I'm not a researcher. Um, we have a bunch of researchers in, the, in our team. Um, they could do a much better talk on this than I can, but I'll tell you from my own experience what we've been doing and how that's been going. Uh, so one very important thing is getting your team out there. Uh, we work with uh, so a, a bunch of our team are actually from India, but uh, a bunch of them are not as well. And in particular for those that are not, or for those that are from India but haven't been there for 20 years, uh, it's pretty important to, to get them out to the markets and get them to experience um, um, a lot of different things in, in, in India and in other countries. So, and don't like, take everybody. Go with engineering, uh, go with UX, go with product managers, go with marketing, everybody. Uh, get in an airplane, go to India and uh, do research there. That's, that's really extremely helpful because even if you just go with a small research group and you report back about what you've learned, the impact of that is just a fraction of, of having people actually experience it themselves. Um, now, there's more to it than just going into an airplane and flying to India. Uh, you've got to set very clear research goal, goals for yourself. <clears throat> you've got to set out, like, what do I want to learn? Um, make it very clear. Um, make out the questions that you want answered. And make out the, the type of questions that you should be asking to answer those questions. Uh, very often, with, I won't go too deep into research methodologies, but very often you can't really directly probe too much into the things that you want to know, so you kind of got to get to it by asking a bunch of questions around people's behavior, and from that you can understand um, uh, where opportunities and needs might be. Sorry, that was a little vague, I, I realized, but uh, I, I'm not a researcher. So. Um, and then it is definitely very important to, after you do this kind of research trip, communicate back to the people that, that stayed at home. And do it in a very clear and very kind of exciting manner where you use videos, use a lot of photos, um, and make sure that people actually want to see it and want to uh, go through it. Uh, field interviews is kind of one very important aspect that uh, I probably like most uh, of, of all the different types of research that we do. Uh, this is you literally go out with a clipboard and with questions on it, and you go to malls, you go to universities, you go to markets, kind of wherever. Um, you just go to, different, to random places, uh, and you start interviewing people. Uh, you get extremely, like, by just doing a couple of these interviews, you already get extremely valuable insights and things you would, you would have never thought of yourself about how people use their phones, how people use the internet, how they go about their lives. It's very interesting. Um, I think one very important thing to keep in mind when you do field interviews is that you get a uh, diverse demographic. Um, this is, it it's kind of sounds pretty uh, obvious, but it's pretty difficult to do. Uh, for example, what I find a lot in India is that I have to do a lot more efforts to get uh, a decent representation of women in the, in the sample because it's very often uh, men are fine talking to you, but women, in particular if women are alone or in small groups, uh, they don't always want to talk to, to, uh, to men. So you really got to do extra effort to, to be able to get a diverse, uh, diverse demographic. Even in big cities? Even in big cities, yeah. yeah. Well, t well, it depends what you call big, but like tier three cities, for example. Yeah. I think you have changed. You fix a new team again. This, I mean, it's not like people don't want to talk to you at all, but um, I mean, still this year I've experienced this. Um, that it's just like men, you get a 100% hit rate if you talk to them. Like they grab their friends and they're like, hey, like, we're getting interviewed, this is cool. Whereas with women, it's, uh, it's kind of hit and miss. Sometimes they, wanna, sometimes they only want to do one minute, and it's just you've got to do more effort. How many states or cities have you covered in India? Like you just go to one particular state, or you mm. go to a couple of states when you go on? Uh, so when we, one trip is, uh, actually it depends. But so, um, it depends. <laughs> that's an that's answer. Uh, a lot of different research teams and research initiatives go to different parts of India. Um, we tend to do, in one research trip, we tend to do like one or two cities. It's kind of, um, but it j really depends on the research trip, right? Um, I think at all times there's probably a couple research trips going on for different products. Um, and they may be in different countries, they may be in rural areas, they may be in tier one cities, they may be in tier three cities. Um, it's just, it really depends on the, on the trip. So, could you explain or share, summarize further? Yeah, 
Yeah, sorry, that's kind of the same point that I was also making on the previous slide. Um, so after a day of doing these type of interviews, I make sure that like, we grab the team together, or maybe the next day we grab the team together, and we go through the, like, the huge pages of notes that we took from the interviews. Um, we, uh, uh, we summarize them together, because different people might have heard different things in the answers as well. Um, we make sure that we have kind of a crisp summary. Uh, we expand that with visuals, such as photos, uh, videos, etc., to make it engaging. And we share that back to the team back in the US uh, to make sure that they uh, learn similar things to some extent as what we've learned on those days. You're a researcher, so please correct me if I'm... Uh, <laughs> if, if... I don't do too much field research. <laughs> oh, you don't do much field, okay. Yeah. How many people did you guys interview in this trip in general? So for field interviews, field interviews is one of the types of, of, of uh, research that we do. But um, <coughs> just like you're bounded by, uh, by you're bounded by the actual time that the interviews take, uh, by the time that it takes to find people on the street, uh, and by the time it takes to get to different places. Because a lot of these cities they're pretty congested, so it can take like two hours to get to one place and two hours to get to another. So in general, uh, I would say, if on a day with a small group of people we interview. Uh, 20 different people or 20 different groups of people, that would be a pretty decent result. One thing I do, do though, in the university is we yeah. have these human subjects, so we have to agree that they have to agree that you know they understand that this is being a research proposal. Uh -huh. Is that something that Google needs to do as well? Uh, yeah, we do. Uh, we have NDAs and, and those type of things as well. Yeah, it depends on the type of research, right? When you um, when we ask a couple questions on the street to someone, it's probably not necessary to, to go through a kind of a formal process. Um, but that also gets me to my next point. When we do interviews with recruited participants, there's definitely a whole part of the process, which is, I know, actually know very little about this, but there is documents they need to sign and agreements. Yeah, yeah so that's a different type of research that we do. Um, also super insightful. Um, it's a little bit less being out there, but um, what we do here is we, um, ask an agency to recruit people for us. Um, and you can tell an agency we want a diverse set of demographics, uh, these type of income levels, <coughs> um, just a different mix of people. Um, and you invite them into the office. And in general, we do uh, one person at a time or small groups at a time. Uh, a general interview would be about an hour. Um, and this would be a pretty typical setting. Uh, this is not the research I was on, but this, this is kind of what it tends to look like. Um, you interview them, uh, you ask a lot of questions. The, the, the main benefit of this would be that you, or actually there's two benefits to this. Uh, one is you can do way longer interviews, so you can be interviewing them for an hour, uh, whereas on the street, nobody's gonna give you an hour of their time, they're gonna be walking away after five minutes. Uh, so you get like a lot of time from people. Uh, and the second is um, they're under NDA, right? You can have them sign an NDA document, so you can test your products with them. Um, that's probably the most valuable part where uh, uh, you ask them to use your software, your website, whatever. Um, you film them while doing it. You notice that everything goes wrong. Um, they, they go, they press everywhere. They don't understand the text. It's, uh, it's always very enlightening to do this type of research. Um, one benefit, one other benefit of this is this can potentially also be done remotely. Um, we've done this a number of times remotely. Um, in my experience, it's, Definitely not as insightful uh, as doing as being there yourself, um, but there's a big benefit to it is that you don't have to travel that far, and so you can you can do it more easily. Do you need some for the interviews? Uh, yeah, also like our researchers would be able to tell it better, but there are incentives I think for the interviews. Yeah, um, and one uh, one thing that I would say if you do this remotely is you gotta have somebody on the ground that is. Uh, very knowledgeable about research and can like really understand what you're trying to do. Uh, so it should be like a, a very good agency or uh, or one of your own researchers, for example. Because um, otherwise, I think this can get it, it can get pretty tricky. Uh, so better to be there live, but uh, if not, there's ways to do remote as well. There's actually some websites that I know that uh, that uh, facilitate doing these type of interviews remotely as well. Yeah, question. Why is such colors? Sorry? Why is such colors? Why such colors? Uh, I think that's uh, it's Ghana, right? I think that the Ghanese colors. So, uh, these kind of, uh, you know, the Not everybody can afford, only Google or Facebook or even 
Yeah, the, I, I guess that's true. At the same time, I don't think this has to be that expensive. I think every type of research you want to do is going to cost money. Um, I mean, the expensive part of this is flying to India, right? That's that's where the the money is. Other than that, there. Sorry. I'm staying there. And, well, staying in India doesn't necessarily have to be very expensive. Right? <laughs> Depends, on Depends on where you stay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I. So yeah, what what type of research would you suggest um, if you if you don't do it like this? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Well, so, so there's two things. Like, you, one, you're assuming there's already a, a product that people are using, right? We're not necessarily, um, for a lot of the things that we're building, we're not necessarily at the stage yet that it's a product that's out there and people are actively using it and we can get those statistics. Um, once we are in that stage, we definitely do that type of research as well. Um, actually, that's kind of a pretty critical part of my job as well, is analyzing that data, trying to understand what's going on. Um, unfortunately, that is a very different type of insight you get than by being on the streets and interviewing people. Uh, so, so I would argue kind of this type of research, in particular the, the, field, uh, the field research that you do, is very, um, you do that in an earlier stage where you really try to develop the idea of your product. And, um, and like here, like when you have an early product that you can test, and a type of uh, data analysis from the, from the logs that you have, from the statistics that you look at, I would say that's slightly later when people are using your product. I wasn't actually here in Ghana. This is a photo I have for, so, for another research. Fair so in general, um, with, uh, with the research that you do in uh, uh, like the different places, yeah. 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 What's kind of the numbers you see with, with uh, you know, cell phone connectivity but not smartphones? Yeah, that's a good question. So we actually, uh, I, I wouldn't be able to answer it. That's, that's a short answer. Uh, the, the thing is that we don't, as Google, we don't really look at feature phones that much. Um, like. We have very limited ability to do things on feature phones and to, to help people on feature phones. So we are like 99% focused on smartphones. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, I, I can't tell you much more. But. Yeah. Um, maybe I'm naive when I say this, but uh, like in the city, I've seen a lot of booths where they give out free smartphones and stuff like that. Have you guys ever thought about doing the same in emerging markets and give out like some type of disclosure like, hey, we're going to track your usage data and stuff like that. No, so giving, giving our free smart? Sorry? Or is that a possibility that something we can do? Um, so yeah, one, I think people overvalue uh, what the value is of the data uh, to us, but also giving out the free smartphones is obviously something that um, you wouldn't be able to do at scale. So uh, I don't think that would be a feasible strategy for us to do. Yep. Yeah, I was just going to agree. Yeah. After that, you really have to follow up with people and find out the why. Yep. Also, if you're developing a product, like you need to do some contextual, contextual research. And just to respond to the person who, I think most of us don't have the luxury of like a Google and the budget and everything, but then that's, that becomes your job as a product manager is to advocate for why that's important, what the business case is for it, what the return yeah. on investment is for it. And yeah, I mean, if you're a valuable product manager, you can do that. Yep. I also think like so. I, w one thing that I've also thought about like doing this in a cheaper manner. And again, I, I think the the thing that makes it expensive is traveling to India because the the distance is just so large. It's pretty much the other side of the world from here. Um, is uh, like for example, uh, rural areas in Mexico might be a, a pretty good substitute. Yeah. Um, a lot cheaper to get to. Um, you do need translators, obviously, but uh, um, that might be. The, I'm pretty sure that, that that might be a decent alternative as well. Yep, question. Uh, is it is the development cost higher because of all these things that you're saying for emerging markets, or 
does it get balanced out when you're developing for you know countries like the U.S. with other things? It's a good question. Is the development cost higher? Um, I've been in finance, so I can give you kind of my financial uh, answer to it. I would say that uh, people are probably by far your most expensive uh, piece of building a product. So um, the efforts that you do to reach users in, uh, in India, for example, are probably um, uh, not that significant part of the, the total cost in comparison to your engineers, your product managers, your designers, etc. Sorry? What? Sorry, thank you. Oh, sorry, thank you. sorry, the light is a little. Do you have a balanced product in India? Do you have a balanced product in India? Um, so we have, um, we have engine, we, we do, we have product teams in India. Um, I currently don't really work with uh, product teams in India, but we have. Um, what makes working with India extremely difficult is the time zone difference. It's like, it's always at a bad time for someone. Um, we have, uh, for example, we have a researcher in India, uh, which is it's absolutely it's great to have a researcher in India, but it is uh, even that is like it's either for her it's late night or very early morning, or for us it's late night or very early morning. So, um, for a little bit of time in the team that I work on, we had uh, part of our team were engineers sitting in uh, in India. Um, it was very difficult for us to to make that work well. Yeah. Why? Because what I feel is, when, um, I'm going to talk about people who are in India. Because mm -hmm. in America, I don't know how the resource goes. Yep. But in India, when you ask people that, how do you like this product? Yeah. Or, are we going to go for this it's product? It's great. They yeah. always talk about the things that they think is wrong with the product. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it gives you the positive aspect because you're the resource team. So you get to know what people are expecting out of you. Yep. So when you when you're thinking of developing a new product, it gives you a lot of information on what you can work on rather yep. than what already is in the market. So it gives a positive aspect to that particular company who are going to research that, yes, this is something that's not in the market yet. So this is something that you can work on. Yep. So that's, I think, face-to-face -face or the research that is done in person, it, it helps rather than analyzing somebody's business data because they're going to use what is available to you they want to work on. Yep. Yeah, no, it's a great comment. And, uh, also, one more thing on that point, if you want to try and do this at kind of a, a lower budget. And what we've also done is we've worked with, uh, with websites that um, do a lot of this process for you um, while you don't have to be there. So there's, there's websites that help you. Uh, they, they get participants. They film them. Uh, they ask them questions. They let them use software. So they take over a large part of that whole process for you, and you don't actually have to travel there. Um, it's it's a little less insightful, I would say, and a little little trickier to do very well than going out there yourself. Uh, but it def that's definitely another option. What's the name of a service that does that? Um, Usertesting.com, I think, is one that does it. Um, but there's probably more. I don't want to advocate one. Uh, there's probably a bunch of them that are great. So we will have a service. <laughs> I don't think we do. <laughs> um, so when you're looking at a new emerging market. Synthesizing the research between so many different um, demographics, uh, I feel like within a culture there's always um, prevailing differences between north or south, the rural, yeah, yeah. city. How do you account like the differences that you see? How do you how does that affect the end result and what kind of trade offs do you make for those differences? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. Like again, I'm talking about next billion markets as if there if there's one thing but like the diversity is just absolutely huge um, so I think it kind of comes back oh no I went to sleep oh, well. um, <coughs> I think it comes back a little bit to uh, to what I said about trying to find these things that they have in common and uh, a couple of these things are um, they're pretty technical they're kind of boring aspects but they're uh, um, uh, kind of the, the the phone specifications that people have the low uh, low internet connectivity um, um, high cost of downloading, all those kind of um, general things that you would see in any type of emerging market. Um, and then, yeah, so to account for, so in India, for example, rural India is just a different world from tier one city India. 
It's uh, like it's it's as different probably as U.S. and Tier One city India. Um, so you obviously you can't build a product for everybody, and that's perfect for everybody. But at least you can build a product that kind of sits in the middle of uh, of what India users might want versus a product that is just sits in the middle of what U.S. users might want. Does that kind of answer? Or? We tend to focus on big cities, um, and I think that's pr primarily because that's where the, the majority of the users are. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's probably, our, I would guess that our products are probably skewed towards people in big cities. Is that, yeah? Okay. So that goes under the assumption that the majority of the potential new users would be you know, clustered towards big cities rather than rural area, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah, I would have to. I would have to look at numbers. My assumption right now would be that the the numbers of new internet users as well as current internet users in big cities are way higher than in rural areas. I think that makes sense because infrastructure wise, and you know, it takes time to propagate the networks of like connectivity. Yeah. Um, I have a question about like since. It seems like billions of new users, yeah. and you can't get like enough um, potential information or knowledge just by like a few clicks. Yep. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, do you like does Google? Or do you guys have like a permanent full-time researcher on site on in India? Oh yeah, yeah. No, we have uh, like a, then, a whole bunch of them. Yeah. So I, I guess your your strategy as a product manager is to go through basically working in collaboration with the full-time researcher. Yeah. And then you also do intermittent uh, trips to gain yep. like specialized, like what what kind of thing that you need to like specifically get there to 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 gain like what kind of knowledge? So you so your question is if you have a researcher in market, why do you need to go out there yourself yeah. as well? Well, honestly, like the researcher is out there like. Ten times, like she does ten times more. The researcher that I work with closely, for example, is out there all the time. So she does ten times the amount of research in India that I do. Um, however, like for me, getting a research report from her versus me being there and interviewing people, um, even if the same insights are in there, the kind of the just kind of how you internalize the knowledge is very different if you spend the full time and you actually interact with people there. Um, so I think it's a great question, it's, but it's, it's, it's kind of a soft answer. It's just, you learn a lot more by interacting and, uh, and, and by spending a lot of time in the market. I had another slide, which I guess I can't get through anymore. Um, but it was a, a slide where I said it's also good to, um, OK. Just gonna, can do this. Yeah, great. Um, so this is one other thing that. Um, that helps you as well, um, at least for me, in particular my first couple trips to India, for example, really help, is uh, uh, what we call immerse in the, in, uh, in the, in the cities there. Uh, so just try and stay at more local type of places, so you can meet locals, you eat local, you, uh, uh, so guest houses might, might be a good choice. Um, visit different areas, it kind of sounds very obvious, but um, at least when I travel normally, I'm used to being a tourist, so I go to like, the main square of a city, and you go to like, oh, the beautiful church that's there, or something like that. Um, you can do that, but that's not like, that's not what what you should be doing probably for your research. You should go to kind of just random neighborhoods, at this random mall here, just travel to all kinds of pretty much random places in the city to get a real feel for this is the everyday life that's going on. Um, then use local technology. So, for example, what we would do is we uh, try and get a SIM card uh, in India. It's actually extremely cumbersome to get a SIM card in, SIM card in India. Uh, but uh, you get a SIM card so you uh, get the same, th same uh, speeds of internet that everybody else is using, uh, the same coverage, etc. cetera. Um, I often go and buy, or not often, but like I've bought a uh, second-hand phone for $30 to uh, get the experience of what it is like to, to be on a, a very low-end phone. Um, talk to uh, shop owners in, the, in, in, uh, in India. But like what apps they use, what they sell, etc. 
Um, so kind of to, to really get a feel for, um, obviously you just scratch the surface, right? Uh, but to, to get a bit of a, a real feel for the everyday life and the everyday technology experience that people have there. How long do you typically stay in a place? How long is the average duration of your trip from US to India? Like when do you know enough is enough research? So th there, um, there's never enough research, I would say. There's like, we always, we're kind of always on short supply of research. Um, there's just so many things that you want to know. Um, so we have, like, I go every couple months. Uh, but as I said, like, we have on our team, there's a researcher that is there continuously. And th in India, sometimes travels to other places to do research there. <coughs> um, so because at different stages of the product cycle, there's also just a different need for research. Um, when you're just trying to understand a certain, uh, certain area, uh, you want to go there to understand how people, like what apps people are using, what, um, what their current behaviors are. When you have your own app, you go there to test the app. Um, so there's kind of very different stages at which you do different research. And I think um, the, the need for research is almost never diminishing. So yeah, that's a good question. Um, a researcher would be able to answer better, but um, so for example, our researcher is located in Hyderabad, so I go to Hyderabad uh, every now and then because that's it's just easy to to coordinate it. Um, she often suggests different cities to go to as well, uh, just for the diversity of it. They have different demographics, cities that are more student heavy, cities that are richer, poorer, uh, tier one, tier three, rural south, north, um, so we, we try to get a diversity of, uh, of different places. But you are already having some products in line in progress. So, like, uh, what kind of uh, information figures do you get? Do you need some data from this? How do you know that? Because you already, like, content of the map is being great. Well, it depends on that. So it depends if you're building something new or you already have something. But in general, as a product manager, you're always building something new, right? Um, you don't rest on your laurels and like, oh, our app is great, we're done. Uh, you kind of try, if your app is out there and it's doing great, you try new features, you, you try like new approaches to things. So I think you're always testing that new thing. Can you help? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yep. Uh, yep. Will it help uh, your team to be more influential to take decisions on uh, your research data? Sorry for. Uh, with your data, is going to help you to influence your team to take decisions whether, like, uh, or is it for just to explore, uh, like, how influential is your data? It's extremely influential. Uh, we make, uh, I would say, research is a, is a. Yeah, I don't know how to phrase it, but uh, I would say like we make all our decisions based on research, pretty much. Yeah, sorry. How was the product design changed based on the insights you got? Um, so, I mean, we define the product. We define what the product is so, uh, based on that research. Um, so it, like, it's very difficult to give a concrete example because everything in the product, like front to back, the idea, the design. Um, oh, but so you're specifically asking about kind of the visual okay, design. For example, you've already given a few examples that if there's no network connectivity or intermittent connectivity. Mm. Uh, the search result would be given to you later on. So yeah. that's one of the design or the product decision that is taken on the inside. Yes. So like and a specific question of mine would be because the network connectivity is too weak, how do you optimize your products to work on slower networks and take less data? Ten minutes? Um so we, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of what I tried to touch on previously. We, um, so for low data in particular, uh, we try to have three different states. One is an offline state where we are pretty confident the user is offline. <coughs> it's not gonna get, it's not gonna go online like very soon probably. Uh, we have the online state where we have pretty decent connectivity and we can work with it. Then we have that intermittent state where sometimes we're getting data, then we're not getting data, uh, then something comes in again. Uh, so we very consciously um, designed to have those three states, no data, uh, online, and intermittent. 
Does it kind of answer your question? So what specific product decisions were taken? Um, Can you take example of any Google service that incorporates such a feature? Yeah, sure. Um, so for example, in the, um, YouTube Go, which is a, a YouTube app uh, that we have for, uh, for India that we're testing out right now, um, one thing that we do is we make it very easy for people to download uh, videos to save offline. So that offline state is kind of a very rich state where you can watch your videos, you can do a lot. Um, we also um, let people, I believe we let people time when videos are being downloaded so they can download it at times when data is cheaper or faster. Um, we also allow people to share the videos that they have offline with other people while being offline. Um, so they don't have to uh, use their data to be able to share videos with each other. So those are kind of, uh, that's very offline focus, not, not as much intermittent focus, but those are, uh, as you can see, like uh, we do a ton of effort to make that offline state a really powerful, really rich state. So I think you, so, so where they contradicted your uh, intuition, I think kind of all the time, you, you, you kind of <laughs> forget your intuition in a sense, because um, you just don't know. You, you kind of got to assume that, uh, that you don't know. And if you start from that basis, uh, you might get less surprised because you actually learn from what you see. Sorry, it's not a very concrete example, but. Uh, no, okay. Do you publish summaries or trends anywhere? So we have, uh, we have some, uh, we have some published results. Like a, a, a number of these slides, for example, uh, are published uh, from I/O, I believe. Um, others are not. We ha yeah, we have some published published reports, but uh, it's mostly for our internal teams. Okay. So like, what, what are some resources that I could look at? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, sorry, I should have known, but I, I don't actually uh, search for it. I think uh, if, if we, so the, the I.O. resources that we have, they're pretty good. Uh, we had like these two hour sessions on, on this topic. Um, and we probably have some other reports out there as well. Uh, sorry, yep. So I just recently heard about the Google Station project where they're doing free Wi-Fi hotspots mm -hmm. and train stations in India. Yep. I'm wondering if you worked on that project at all, or if you uh, know anything about how this type of research informed that. Um, so I worked, uh, I know a bunch of people on that project, and they sit very close to me, kind of a couple, yeah, yeah. A couple hundred feet, if less. <clears throat> um, how did research inform that? I, I haven't been as exposed to their research uh, to be able to tell you, but that is definitely, uh, um, that is definitely a, a research-based uh, product where people went out to India a lot, they noticed this kind of, uh, w w this is also something we've noticed in our research. Um, you notice people kind of bundling around Wi-Fi hotspots. And we have great photos of it where you see like a group of 50 people in one corner and you're like, hey, why is everybody there? And it's, there's a great Wi-Fi hotspot there. Uh, so I, I think it comes from those type of insights. So I think uh, Google Station is considered uh, um, is going gr is going great. I understand. Um, so what's the duration? Like, is it like one year, two years, three years? Like I mean, if a product is successful, it's going to be there uh, forever, right? Okay. Uh, I mean, this question is to all the product managers. Mm -hmm. So how important is it to start your product development with zero assumptions? So I would guess, so it's, it's a good question, it's a, it's a broad question. I would guess like having zero assumptions is gonna slow you down because you don't know, like you have to like get everything from data and research. Uh, but in particular, when you do the type of thing we do, you build for people that are uh, in very different places and uh, very different cultures than our own, then that is kind of the place where you gotta start, zero assumptions and everything is based on the research that you do. Yep. People are a big risk, oh, sorry, I didn't. Um, like research is kind of an insurance to knowing what the people 
people want in a new market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what are some other risks involved in entering a new market, would you say, and what are some insurances that you would take to... Oh, interesting question. So you say the fact that you don't understand the people is a risk, and your research is an insurance against... That's what you're saying, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's a very different kind of frame from, from how I normally think about it. <coughs> um, and also, we don't really think about entering new markets as much, because um, we have some usage of most of our products in a lot of markets. It's more that we kind of try and make our products better for those markets. So I don't really know if I can, I can, I can answer that question very well. I guess an emerging market? Is, that, is there a difference between entering or, or in an emerging market? So, so for us, like, let's say you look at a product like uh, YouTube, right? Um, it's being extremely widely used already in India. Um, and then what we try to do is we uh, try to make it a better experience for people there. So there is, it's not as much kind of entering a market, it's more um, this is what we currently do in the market. It works so-so for people. Let's make it great for people. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if I can give much advice about entering markets. As a follow-up to that, um, yep. earlier you mentioned about these five considerations they have for yep. you know, uh, altering an existing product. Yeah. Um, but is there any product that's more country specific? Let's just say, for example, payments or, you know, for example, WeChat has all these different boxes. Yeah, yeah. Payments, uh, social media, and all and one thing. So that, that might be one, or maybe the white might be another, but what would be one that is just country specific that you use these insights? Yeah, so uh, Google Station, for example, is one that's uh, country specific right now. Um, so in general, Google tries to build as much to scale as possible. And even though India is like this huge market, um, there's just <laughs> the world's pretty big. So uh, we try to build products that perhaps you start building them for one market and then like uh, make sure that they work in a lot of markets as well. Um, but we tend to not limit ourselves to a single market for a product. So countries with restrictions. Um, I mean, China is, a, I think, an obvious example of, of a country with restrictions. Um, I, don't, I know very little about China. And my focus is primarily on these three countries, actually, that we mentioned earlier, India, Indonesia, uh, Brazil. Uh, restrictions there are very limited. Um, so we, we're going to take two more questions. Two more? OK. okay. Um, okay. We'll feel pressure. <laughs> Yeah, so I think like that, that definitely requires a certain approach, but I don't know very much about it. Okay, I think that's it. I have like two more questions. Okay, we have time for more questions if anybody has one more question. Uh, I don't know. Oh, there's two more questions. Okay. Yep. Ooh, interesting. So I think what's most important is um, it's not really about the questions you ask. It's more about understanding their behavior. Um, and you do have to ask it through questions. But um, are you referring specifically to when you already have a product? or? Yeah, yeah. Just uh, when you have, say you have a product and you want to think about how you improve it. You know, are you you're asking them how you use your product and what are you missing? Or yeah. Yeah, those kind of questions would be would be decent. Um, again, there's a whole uh, like research methodology. I hardly dare touch the subject because it's such a huge subject, and there's very specific methods to it. Um, but yeah, you can. Uh, it's what is great, for example, is have them show you things on their phone. So you say, "Oh, how are you using this right now?" And they show you. Like you learn a lot from that. Um, ask them, um, "Have you used this feature? Um, what is your general impression of this website or this app?" I do, those just kind of very, I would, I would say try and ask very broad questions, because then you will probably learn most. Right, Is that, OK, we can talk later. Uh, how do I like, uh, apply for become a product manager at Google? Or, like, uh, preparation? Um, so I mean, applying itself is, is just through, we have jobs at Google.com where you apply. But um, I mean, there's, I, I imagine product school themselves, they offer great courses to, to it. Um, 
mainly you need to build good experience in uh, some technical understanding, some kind of general business understanding, and then, uh, uh, um, if at all possible, experience having built a couple products. It can be yeah. small products, but... I'm an engineer, so I do not have experience building like products the way you do. I just yep. deal with code. Yeah. How do I approach... Um, yeah. So expanding, I think expanding on your business side would probably be, uh, as for an engineer, would be would be good advice. Um, you see a lot of engineers with MBAs, for example, that become product managers. That's a, like probably the most typical product manager background. Um, and then build a couple products yourself, where you don't just uh, like you actually build it end to end. You try to understand what to build. You try to get users. And in particular, if you get a bunch of users on it, that that's kind of the whole goal of being a product manager. So then uh, then you've done it right. All right.